Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm very well. A little bit warm. Isn't it? It's lovely. I know my wife shouts at me every time I say that. She likes it a little bit cooler than we've got it at the moment. (laughs) Yeah, but the temperature's certainly been uh, pretty high these last few weeks, hasn't it, Peter? Definitely, and I see the... In the news, the hose pipe bans are coming out good and fast and strong, aren't they? They are. So for us gardeners, it's a, a, a challenging time. At this Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the watering can is it's a bit more hard work, but it, it keeps us fit. We shouldn't moan. Indeed. And of course, uh, you know, we, we, we're all changing the way we plant our gardens. So more, more the merrier, really, with, with what's happening out there. We're having to be a little bit more careful in our, our plantings at this time of the year. Well, that's it, and equally, the mulches really do work, don't they? I mean, you think sort of you you water the mulch, and that holds the moisture in and saves the plants that little bit. But I must say, I haven't watered my garden now this entire drought, and <laughs> it's got some severe patches in it. And yeah, but I haven't mown it, so it, it's looking it's fine. okay. But yeah. you you see people who have mown the lawn, and mm, it's not looking so good. It is doesn't it? look good, does no, it? No. But, that's life. We shouldn't mind. No. So, so today we have something rather special, haven't we, Peter? Yes, we've got a great guest on today. We've got Pauline Brown, one of the partners from our garden centre. I know, and uh, it's great to, to sort of chat through the, the whole process of, you know, we're sat in a, a wonderful building on an 11-acre site in, just outside Buckingham. And yep. we're going to sort of explore the whole the history of how the garden centre came about, and uh, obviously a little bit more about, uh, about about Pauline and her interest in gardening. Yeah, because the garden centre here at Buckingham is a family business. Parents started it back in 1970 in February, just at the start of spring. Yes, <laughs> many many odd years ago, we had our 50th anniversary. Where are we? A couple of years ago now. Indeed. I think Um, the pandemic slightly took the shine off our uh, our celebrations, didn't it, if I remember rightly? It did. That's life, isn't it? And the images I've I've got in my head of the nursery, it started off essentially as a field and with a road down the middle of it. And that then evolved into a more formal brick building. And then that evolved into a much larger building and then we had another redevelopment Mm -hmm. um the last redevelopment here i'm going to say is about 12 years ago Mm -hmm. and that i'm going to say turned us into what i'd now class as a i suppose a destination garden center isn't it it, yes most definitely yes with a lovely restaurant and all the additions which the that new development uh, added to to the size and yeah, yeah, the giftware department is larger the, car park as well. That's yes. it. And, uh, yeah, yeah, my the tarmac car park. I mean, I can, my memory as a child is um, cycling around the site, uh, um, and there was a ironstone mm. car park oh, wow. essentially, and it was lovely in the summer for cycling as a child, but in the winter it was a bit bit of a mess um, and no I, I mean essentially full credit to my parents they've worked incredibly hard to develop the site mm. from the nurse when they bought it okay and now it's uh like we say full-on garden and center, center isn't yeah, it and mm. nursery as well yeah and that's the thing isn't it with with uh, the progression and it's great you know people who come and visit the garden center we have plenty of photos showing those uh, those monumental dates over yep. the decades over five decades yep. so people can actually see what we've, we've we've developed over that time which is always exciting and gives you a perspective of of how things evolve yeah and uh, i think when the most poignant facts my father ever told me was um, obviously we've got the mail order business mm-hmm. here and we sell thousands of hedging plants every year mm-hmm. and uh, it must be a good 10 years ago he told me that if you planted all the hedging plants a foot apart that we'd sold mm-hmm. up to that point we would have gone to the moon in distance That's which a lot of plants <laughs> yeah it, it, i think it's something like 250,000 miles of hedging wow that yeah. we've sold which is yes an incredible it is. amount yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. and yeah. obviously around the, the uk and, and further and beyond obviously a lot of our plants historically have gone even across the water Yep, before Brexit times, when people had their lovely uh, holiday homes in in France and Spain, and I know I, I served one customer who had a, a, um, a Greek garden, 
who oh, wanted right. her a lovely display of, uh, she wanted some lovely natives she could look out of in her, in her little uh, villa. Right. Uh, and that's what she did. She came along when she was on her way uh, and packed her car. We we stuffed her, her very small car with all these uh, bare-rooted and potted plants so she could take her piece of of, uh, of England to, to uh, back out uh, abroad. Yeah, that's yeah. brilliant, isn't it? But yeah, I, I think that's one of the most lovely thoughts I have mm. about this place is all of the mm. plants and hopefully wildlife that has then gone on to live in the yeah. plants and trees and hedges that we've grown here. And you think hopefully we've mm. done our little Certainly bit to bit, yes. help mm-hmm. the environment and everything that goes along yeah. with that. The, the beautification of the countryside and our gardens. What could be better? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. So today on Ticket, we're delighted to be joined by Pauline Brown, one of the partners of Booking of Garden Centre and Nurseries. Pauline, welcome. Hello, Chris. And normally we, we start the question off to say where exactly we are. So we are actually on the site uh, on a beautiful August day, uh, probably going to be another scorcher record temperatures wise. Um, so I suppose the first question is, as we're in Buckingham, why did the Garden Centre develop here on this wonderful bit of uh, land a couple of miles out of Buckingham Town Centre. Right, well, back in the 1969, it would mm. have been, we decided we were going to try and set up a garden centre. That was my, in those days, mm. fiancé and I. And we were looking for a site um, out of London because the nursery used to be based in Harrow on the Hill, which was very much um, in London. And we wanted more space so we could develop we looked at quite a few sites and we came to this one and were very impressed by the fact it already had planning permission, but it hadn't been developed. So it would be a carte blanche for us to go in, do what we wanted to and get going. So that is why we came to Buckingham. I didn't know the area before. The big mistake we made was to go into a site which was on a hill. Right. Because it's caused a lot of problems over the years. So we'd been better had we pa- managed to have found a flat field. <laughs> but anyway, apart yeah. from that, it's a perfect site because we've got a good main road and we've got services here. And mm. so I think yeah. we're very fortunate to have found it. Indeed. Well, you mentioned um, obviously previously the Harry on the Hill um, nursery. How has that sort of impacted on what we do on the site today? Oh, a lot. Because John. It was very enterprising, very, very knowledgeable on perennial, perennials, alpines, cacti. And he'd been, when he came back from the war, um, he he's lost his business. He had a wholesale business uh, way. He was doing wholesaling of um, vegetables and that mm-hmm. type of thing. Okay. That had been bombed out, and so he's left with nothing, and he had two young children to feed and a wife. Right. So he started the business um, and... He weren't managed to develop it. In fact, he was not just selling plants that he was growing, but he started to buy in bare root stock, i.e. hedging plants, fruit trees. And this is what we have continued with. Unfortunately, we don't do any growing now because for various reasons, it's just not practical. But um, he gave us the idea and the contacts in various parts of this country and, of course, on uh, the continent as well. Indeed, yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing, isn't it? That the the, uh, the business has evolved so much over the years. But you know, taking it back to you know the nineteen seventies, can you remember sort of the first sort of parts of the project which had to be done? What was the what was the you know the number one job which you you wanted to get done to to, to give the, the the nursery a bit of a structure? Well, we obviously put we bought a terrapin building. It's one of those old fashioned um, flat roof buildings which we used for the shop. It was quite small. We had a tiny office in the back and uh, toilet facilities for staff only. Um, and we then needed to develop somewhere to sell the plants from. And we, f- this is the top area of the nursery, which was flat. And because of dear Dr. Beeching, there were a lot of uh, railway steepers available. <laughs> so we constructed um, the plant beds from railway steepers around the outside, and then obviously an area in the middle which we then put up um, the signage for the plants. So um, that's how we got it going. We, we wanted somewhere to sell basic gardening tools and in those days quite a lot of chemicals, obviously fertilisers, 
We also needed to be able to buy in and sell composts of various types, and in those days, large bales of peat, mm. um, which are now no-no. Indeed. Um, but to start to get a structure, so when customers came, they could see that we were a beginning of a garden centre, albeit very small and very... Oh, very few plants, really, in mm-hmm. comparison with what we've got now. But we did have the big open field, which gave us the possibility of bringing in hedging plants and bare root trees to heal in in the winter and carry on John's way of sending things out by mail order, as well as selling to the local customers as well. Yeah. I mean, I think, to put it into perspective for our, our Diggit audience, I mean, garden centres really only started in the, the late 1950s, early 60s, when course we got plastic and containerization so you know 1970 was really the early stages of the whole development of the garden center sort of world yes it certainly was because uh, although we've carried on selling all the bare root stock a lot of garden centers now only sell mm. from containers which of course now are Recyclable plastic, a lot of them. Indeed. Things have changed enormously over the years. One thing I'd like to say is that over the years we have evolved, obviously, but we have kept all the core lines of gardening here. We emphasise the fact we love plants and we've got a very, very wide range of plants and we are not the sort of centre where you come in and for instance, at Christmas time, all you get is Christmas, Father Christmas, and that sort of thing. We have still got the core things in. We are ready always to put out, say, 50 varieties of seed potatoes, um, which people can come in and buy one of one variety, 20 of another. They can pick what they want because they are what we would call genuine gardeners. Mm. And this is something that... Um, as a family, we've tried to keep all the time that we are a garden centre which has got a core objective of giving brilliant service on communication, variety of plants, and on top of this, we obviously do now have a large shop as well with other goodies which are not entirely related to gardening. But we pride ourselves on the plants that we have, the quality, the way they're laid out, and everything to do with plants. Plants is our passion. Yeah, and I think uh, that often comes over, certainly with uh, gardeners who come in with their uh, their list of plants and they're trying to locate them. So, mm. uh, you know, an A to Z of the shrubs and certainly the perennials at the moment, especially at this time of the year, goes down a lot better than just trying to find the mad hog, which often is a bit of a frustration in, in certain garden centre chains and some yes. of the, the DIY stores. But do you think, Pauline, you know, we've seen changes on, on plants over the years, um, have we seen any radical changes over those 50-odd years as far as the plants we're buying? Well, I think that gardeners at one stage, when the funds were available, were wanting large plants. I mean, obviously with hedging, one starts with small ones because that's the, the sensible way of doing it. But people would really come in and be very happy to pay for a large plant to put into their garden to give structure straight away. We're actually seeing the cycle go back round a bit now, that people funds are not so good, and also gardens tend to be smaller. So people are more willing to start with smaller plants and, and grow on if they're given the good advice of how to do this. So yes, mm. it, it's something that we've over the years has changed, but um, we are constantly looking at what people are wanting and trying to get in what they're wanting. If it's things that we don't have in stock, we're always willing to try and buy them specially, um, even though it's quite a lot of work for very little money. Indeed. It gives the service. So on the, the plant varieties we have at, at Buckingham uh, Gardens and on the nursery side, uh, Pauline, there's obviously a, a lot of interest in, in sourcing these plants. Um, years ago, I, I remember uh, the RHS brought out a, a plant finder book, which basically was your sort of point of reference I believe we've got quite a few of those plants in that, uh, that, that that wonderful reference book. We certainly have, and it's a uh, every year that it comes round, I've got to update how many we've got. Mm-hmm. And as it is oh, several hundreds, it's a major task to make sure it's totally accurate. And the unusual ones we've got are accurately spelt, mm-hmm. one thing, 
um, and submitted correctly year on year. But it, it does mean that uh, people can actually look in that plant finder, either online or buy the book themselves they want to, and from that they can see that we obviously have got quite a few things that other people do not have. Yeah, indeed, and I think certainly the the, uh, the online side of it has really taken off now. I think to to buy the books quite expensive. And of course, it it becomes very dated very quickly. That's the problem because it has to be updated on a on a regular basis. So, I think the RHS do a great job to keep the the online side of things uh, uh, as, as as applicable as possible. And of course, we've we've seen quite a few plants over the years sort of come and go out of fashion. And sometimes the the plant finder is a good indicator of what actually is a good plant in a way. Yes, that's true, because a lot of them have got awards, mm -hmm. and the plant finder actually indicates whether it has got an award. Um, in the same way as we try to in our catalogue, we put a, a little symbol to mm -hmm. show that this has got an award, or also that it's got plant readers' rights, which of is course. another thing mm -hmm. which one's got to be very careful. When you're selling plants, some of them cannot be propagated, mm -hmm. um, so this is important that customers are made aware of this. Yeah. And, th and these awards we're, we're talking about, they're the RHS AGM awards, aren't they? So Some of them are, yes. Are, yes. Yeah, oh, which yeah. obviously is a, a good point for, for anybody who's looking for good plants which have a good doers in the garden. Obviously the RHS spend a lot of time trialling lots of plants which eventually do get that accreditation if they're good enough. Yes. And uh, it's always good to see those sort of plants. And it's, there's more plants than ever before coming onto the garden centre with that, that little trophy symbol, which is always, for me as a, as a horticulturalist, is always quite gratifying to, to see. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's always good to see them coming in. And the fact that a lot of the um, labels which come in with the plants have this already on, mm -hmm. um, because to try and get that information on our own labels mm. is not enough space. But if it's just a nice little symbol yeah. on a, a picture label, which customers do like, then we'll buy in the labels to put in with the plants. And I think labelling is, is important, certainly over the over the 50 years, there's been obviously a big change around in the way we, we label stock, you know, from uh, from you know basic descriptions now to full labels, again, accreditations if it's an, an AGM or it's a PBR, a plant protected rights variety, or if it's actually got any wildlife qualities, of course. Well, yes, because uh, um, <clears throat> so many of the plants which are, um, are not good for wildlife because they they don't have the nectar and the pollen easily available. Um, these really double flowers are a bit of a problem very often because the insects can't get into them. So very often we'll have on the actually indicating that they are good for wildlife. That's not just the bees, but the beetles, the bats. Mm. All these creatures are very, very dependent yeah. on us gardeners giving them the right plants in the right places. Indeed. And yeah, so the, the RHS uh, Plants for Pollinators little logo yes. is becoming more and more popular now. So that's worth looking out for if you, you're you looking at for your, your AGM uh, symbol and the, the Plants for Pollinators, it means that you've got plants which have got good value. And people are asking for those sort of plants now. And it's sure. also, the I find it's interesting looking at the plants on display in the garden centre. Mm. You have a dis on our end of our beds, we actually have displays of plants mm. and we'll have several different ones all there and you'll find the bees or the insects going for one mm. and it'll be the same variety as the one next to it but they prefer one colour to another Indeed. Um, and it's something that you, you because we have bees our own beehives here we a lot of bees around and it's fascinating watching which plants those mm. bees actually go for and watching them filling up their little pollen sacks on their legs, and off Indeed. they go to the hive, and Indeed. think a bit later, we're selling the honey. Indeed. We yes. produce some of our own plants <laughs> before the customers buy them and take them away. Yeah, Indeed. yeah I mean, of the, the whole area of, um, sort of wildlife gardening, I'm sure we're, we're as my, many garden centres, very conscious of the, the fact that the importance of not only stocking you know, the plants, but the sort of products as well. And obviously we've seen over the last 50 years a big change around on the use of chemicals. Yes. Um, I mean, quite quite scary times. I know I've been in horticulture coming up to 40 years and I've seen a lot, but obviously um, that, 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 that has been quite monumental, hasn't it, Pauline? Well, it has, yes, because um, when, I'm going to say when we first started, but when um, many years ago, you could almost, any disease, sell somebody something to whack on it, mm -hmm. put dust on it or whatever. That number of chemicals and things has been 
brought down and down and down. Quite rightly so, because mm-hmm. the trouble is that the um, the pollinators pick up those things which are supposed to be killing the plants, but it'll kill them as well. Indeed. And they'll take it back to their nests, um, the bumblebees and uh, first thing out in spring, mm-hmm. taking back poisons, which is not good. Yeah. So although we gardeners sometimes grumble that we can't use something, it's far better to garden and make sure the birds come in and eat the aphids. Mm-hmm. Um, don't feed them too much, feed them, but if they come in, have a bit of food, and then they see a rose, for instance, with a load of black fly on it, they'll go and eat the black fly for you. Um, and, you know, your wildlife looks after its wildlife as well, mm-hmm. and we gardeners should be encouraging this and making sure the customer does do the right things and not use lots of nasty chemicals, yeah. but to feed well so the plants are healthy and happy. At the moment, water, which is going to be a, a, it's a really big problem, but nature will put it right in the end. Yeah, I think it's quite good that obviously a lot of the chemical companies have, by pressure now, you know, reformulated their products, or they've just been basically dropped by the wayside. So I think a lot of those nasty uh, neonicotinoids type yes. chemicals have gone, which is which is great. Um, but that it does beg the question, you know, you know, as gardeners, are we are we doing enough for our wildlife? <sighs> Probably never. Mm. I think that um, every time you do any planting in the garden, you need to think about hedgehogs, for instance. Um, If you don't want a hedgehog house buying a particular one, which is going to cost a lot of money, just make some a corner at the back of the bed. You can put some sticks down and various things to give shelter. Um, Just little things like that. Bug houses as well. You can buy ready-made mm. ones, or you can buy some canes, make your own. Yeah. Um, you see them all over the place now, and they are very, very effective. Yeah. Um, you've got the, the mason bees, which nest in that type of, the, of um, tube, I suppose one could say. Mm-hmm. And so you can make these things, come and maybe look at the commercial ones, and then scratch your head and go home, how can I make this myself? Yeah, how can I make sure there's always water out for the the birds and the other insects as well, because in this sort of weather, they're going to get thirsty. Um, So, uh, you know, a bird table with water available, unfortunately, the birds come along and have a bath in it and sprint all the water around everywhere, but just go and top it up every day, make sure that the insects and birds are all looked after. Yeah, Yeah, very important there. I was going to say, one of the questions I was going to ask Pauline was... um, in creating you know, the Garden Centre over the last 50 years, have you had any sort of major challenges, any big challenges which have been, you talk about a bit of head scratching, <laughs> caused uh, a, lot of, a lot of problems? Or? I wouldn't say a lot of problems. It's really been expanding, increasing the size of the shop and doing it in a way that A, doesn't disrupt the customer flow while we're trying to do it and to make sure that we're creating... A really good atmosphere for people to come to, or by it sometimes they're just coming in to have a cup of tea with their mother or something like that. But when they walk through, they can see all these inspirational things, like the packets and packets of seeds, mm-hmm. which um, you know people walk by. Oh yes, I could grow that. Um, just to give people the the feeling that we are a garden center that um, is giving all the different things obviously the basic tools are here but um again people need a bit of help sometimes they're starting a garden of their own what do they need um so it it's it's a constant battle so so on on that sort of angle um sort of advice for somebody new to gardening probably what would you be sort of suggesting they they maybe do well hopefully they'll have a relative or a friend who's a good gardener Mm -hmm. go and talk to them they have got the experience which you won't have if you're starting. Um, there's a lot of brilliant books available. If you like reading, go to your local library. There's a great shelf of in Buckingham Library. There are masses of them, yeah. really interesting books. And also inspirational that they've got some about people who've actually set up gardening. Mm. Um, and it, it's... It's really a question of learning from those who actually 
have um, done it themselves. Also, of course, we've got an experienced staff here and they just love answering questions. Come in with any question you, you want. If we don't know the answer, we'll find out and yeah. phone you back if necessary. But you've got to ask. Yeah. Gardening is not something that's easy. No. Um, you make a lot of mistakes, but don't be put off by your, your mistakes. No. That's how you learn, isn't it? It is, sort of definitely, yeah. the gardening, yes. yes yeah. mm. And I think on, on that sort of front, uh, you know, the, the whole process of, of, of learning about gardening has changed quite a bit, though. I mean, you know, we've got a lot of online YouTube videos now and all that sort of side of things. But however, I mean, reference books are, are a, a key essential for anybody certainly wanting to refer to, to plants. Um, any, any sort of sort of preferences on books you'd, you'd possibly recommend, Pauline, on that? Oh, gosh, I've got a whole bank of them beside me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not very good at remembering names, I'm afraid of them. There's a brilliant one by um, the herb lady, J uh, Jika. Jika. Yes, mm -hmm. she has written a really good one. I think it's co-authored with Bob Flower, do you, I believe? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Excellent book. Um, <laughs> going back to the old RHS books. Of course. Um, yes. There's some very good ones of those. Uh, Again, I think just it's a difficult one to recommend mm. yeah. anything in particular because my knowledge has mainly been learnt over the years. As you're saying, of gardening, you've got to learn. Mm -hmm. I came into this industry with the only knowledge being I had a father who was brilliant gardener but vegetable gardener, oh, and mother was the one who grew the flowers, and I learnt a lot from them. Um, but I had no formal education at all. But you just learn. You just pick things up over the years and then end up with all sorts of crazy bits of knowledge, which yeah. are stuck up in the grey matter up there they somewhere. Are. But yeah. it's amazing how useful they can be sometimes. Indeed. Yes. So, Pauline, thinking over the, the sort of last 52 years, have you any sort of defining moments which you sort of stand back and think, wow, that worked well? Gosh, that's a, quite a difficult question to think. come up with a defining moment. I think possibly the opening of the shop as it is today mm. um, because up to that point we'd been always thinking we haven't got enough, haven't got enough, haven't got enough whereas now I feel that we've developed enough for it to be a good destination garden centre with lots of plants and obviously franchises as well some mm. extremely good one and um, it I think it was that opening moment when um, we've been working so hard all these years and you just felt that we've achieved something at last. But, of course, we've got to carry on. Indeed, you've got to carry on evolving. And I remember, yes. obviously, uh, it was 2012 was the, the year, and I remember running up to that, we had the coldest winter for a long time, I think we had uh, minus 15, minus 16 for four or five consecutive nights, which caused absolute havoc to a lot of our plants that, yes. that particular year. And we obviously were snow covered for, for many weeks, whilst a lot of the work was being Yes, being it was on. being done. Yeah. Yes. But it did mean that um, mm. the staff who hadn't got quite so much to do on the plant here built the most amazing snowman, <laughs> <laughs> which we've got a photo of somewhere. Indeed. And, you know... Yep. When when we can't get on with the proper work, yep. it's nice that staff can get together and do mm. something daft and yep. enjoy themselves. Yeah. And I suppose that sort of logically takes us on to, to, to climate change. We're obviously experiencing a very dry, hot summer. Um, obviously the driest, hottest July on record, as the, the Met Office have told us. And obviously August is looking like we're into, into drought. Um, Global warming and gardening, any, any thoughts on what we need to be thinking about? Well, assuming it carries on, we've got to change how we're planting mm. to go for plants that are more drought resistant. Um, I mean, I just think in my garden, I've got two little narrow beds um, outside the property and one of them's full of sedum and the other one has got a mixture of heliants and virginia mm. and things like that in right. it. Yeah. I water the one with the Heliants and Virginia. The sedum are absolutely thriving, having not been watered all through this heat wave. Oh. They're looking superb, better than they have done for years. So I think this is where we've got to think. 
Mm-hmm. If we're planting against a house where you've got the extra heat from the mm-hmm. building radiating out, to think about what we're doing, mm-hmm. and everybody's got to realise that some of the um, plants that we thought were not hardy mm-hmm. are, in fact, at the moment, going to be hardy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, of course, it could revert the other way, and yeah. then we're going to lose all those. But sure. that's that's mm-hmm. gardening yeah. for you. Yeah, you've just got to work with it, haven't you? You just, have, yeah, yes. Indeed. And I'm thinking uh, on, on that front as well... Um, we, we had a chance a few weeks ago to, to go to Ball Colgrave and we, well, we, had, we had a chat with old Stuart Low, Lowen who obviously has been a, a previous um, Dig It guest and we did note the heat on containers and we, we actually observed how certain pots could cause a problem because they were potentially overheating. And also they made the mistake of making it look really attractive by having grey white gravel on one large area and they said this is a big mistake because it's reflecting the heat yep. so again in your own gardens think yep. about things like that mm. it might not be a good idea it might look attractive but you're going to create heat and this is what we're not wanting to do in the future yeah, yeah no for, for sure and certainly at the garden centre we, we always try and promote displays i know of, of drought tolerant plants i'm sure we'll be doing a lot more of that and of course we've done lots of bee friendly displays um do you feel that as gardeners we are being more conscious in our efforts to be planting more ethically you know i'm thinking of sustainability now of, of being more careful with what we're, we're actually planting well i hope we are i think in my own garden i'm certainly thinking about things of that type um also going back to a lot of more people are wanting to grow their own food, mm-hmm. which is something which used to be very, very popular. I say that's where I learned mm-hmm. a lot of my gardening was from my father, who kept us family mm-hmm. in vegetables and fruit virtually all year round. Um, I think we drifted away from that, but a lot of people are now coming back to it, and allotments are just totally booked these mm-hmm. days, and people are wanting to plant in their garden and create a bit of food themselves, which can be done even if you've got a flower bed. Why not plant some beetroot? Lovely, lovely deep purple leaves on them. Put those in. Purple leaf lettuce. There's all sorts of things you can actually plant amongst your, what should be a shrubbery, to produce some food. And of course, apple trees are beautiful in the spring. So rather than just have an ornamental tree have an ornamental tree that also produces fruit Um, so i think the it's a cycle going round again that people are trying to feed themselves Mm -hmm. and feed themselves without the use of chemicals indeed yes it's that combination isn't it now we mentioned uh, briefly in apples obviously um uh, in a couple of months' time at the Garden Centre, we have our Apple Weekend, uh, the 1st and 2nd of October. I thought I'd give that a little plug because it's an important date for us uh, at Buckingham. But you have quite a bit of connections with Midshire's Orchard. So yes, the Midshire's Orchard Group. We've been members for many, many mm-hmm. years. And they have been promoting the planting of old apples, mm-hmm. especially regional ones as well, if possible. They tend a big orchard over in Milton Keynes where they've got m- loads and loads of new varieties, or I should say old varieties, newly planted, mm-hmm. um, plus an old hedgerow which is full of plums, for instance. Um, and they, altogether, these, these you know, people who belong to groups like that are promoting the fact that the, uh, the older varieties sometimes aren't better but some of them are delicious and you cannot buy them in the supermarkets so if you want a really tasty apple Ashmi's kernel for instance mm-hmm. which is, I've got an enormous one in my garden every year it produces I wouldn't say tons but lo- loads and loads of apples which mm-hmm. keep well mm-hmm. amazing flavour and have you ever seen one in the supermarket? No, I don't think I have definitely not um, no. but th- mm-hmm. this is what I think that um, a any good garden centre ought to be promoting Mm. is keeping the older varieties and seed as well. Mm. I mean, some of the old varieties of seeds and beans are so much better than some Mm. of the modern varieties. 
Um, and I wouldn't say they're drought resistant. My peas and beans have been absolutely useless this year, not only because my rabbits or the rabbits in the fields have got in, but they're just not growing properly. No. Um, and I've heard a lot of people saying that their runner beans haven't got to any height this year because of the conditions. Yeah. But some of the older ones, the older varieties of peas, for instance, grow up to six to eight foot high. Yeah. And those wouldn't get to the same height, but at least they would crop yeah. as yeah. against on the modern varieties, which have been specially bred to be smaller and more manageable, probably are not um, actually producing so well. No. It's interesting, you mentioned about uh, peas. I, I, grew a variety, I grew a variety called Alderman, which gets about oh, yes. five, six foot. Um, mine came into flower at the top of the plant about a month ago, produced right. a few pods, and then the whole plant became rubbish by mildew. As oh. so, so I lost the I lost the crop. Oh, so so unfortunately, yeah, mildew resistance and resistance in varieties, especially a lot of the new varieties, is important. But as you say, Pauline, if you if you want a variety which with a specific purpose to give you height or flavour, yes, that's the compromise, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is definitely. Yeah. Yes, the um, yeah, there, there's a lot of old ones out there, and I tend to grow the older ones every year. I get mine from HDRA. Mm-hmm. I get a certain number of seeds each, um, from them. Um, and they tend to always be better flavour, I'd say, a lot mm-hmm. of them yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, Garden Organics, obviously their heritage seed programme yes. is important. And, and uh, I know when we were chatting to uh, one of the, their team a few months ago, it was important that those the genetics of those varieties, where flavour and yes. reliability and continuity of cropping is mm. important to retain, to, to put them into the gene pool yes. for all of the new varieties. Mm. So... Um, yes, I think it's the same with fruit altogether as mm. well. That um, a lot of the new varieties are extremely good, but we need the old ones because if something goes wrong, they can go back to those older varieties and um, again start propagating from them. Indeed. Okay, so you've, you've had obviously quite a number of gardens pulling over your, your life, and obviously whilst working at the garden centre. Could I ask if you can give us any sort of tips on? You know things you've found from working on these these gardens as as a as for practical tips for for our listeners. Well, I think the first one is if you're moving into a new property, the garden is the priority, not the decorating in the house. <laughs> okay. Your decorating can be done at any time and it's reasonably fast. If you want to make over a kitchen or something, okay, that might take longer, but the plants in your garden are going to take years to grow and mature. Mm. So get out into your garden, try and work out what you want to do. If, you, if you're a new gardener, then you've got bigger problems. But as I said earlier, ask advice, get friends around to have a look, decide what you're going to do. Get your garden going first, um, and then you can do the rest later. So when you say get it going, are you thinking about putting in sort of more long-term, longer establishing plants? Um, yes, I so think things, um, if you want to divide your garden, put hedges in Mm -hmm. to divide it up into different areas or you want to block out your neighbours you you know you might be very friendly with them but it's nice to be able to sit out in your garden without somebody looking over you so Paul, we're talking about uh, trees uh, for setting up in your 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 new garden any any thoughts of of good good varieties to species to be putting in depends on the size of your garden Mm. really does and you've got to be very careful to look at what they are going to grow to because there's no point in putting in what looks like a, a really attractive, maybe young amenantia, which is eventually going to grow up and up and up. Mm-hmm. And okay, you could prune it, but you've, you've got to think and look very carefully. I mean, there's some excellent trees for screening, other ones for obviously for producing food as well. But I think that, it, again, we're going back to labels, that we really need good labels, which I hope we have, and so people can actually see what the ultimate height and spread of the various plants they're going to put in their garden. I mean, you could be like the Dutch who put great big things in and then after 10 years dig it up and start again. Um, that, it's a different philosophy on gardening. I prefer to garden for the future and not think, oh, I've got to dig that up afterwards. Indeed. So, yes, do that. And also make sure in designing your garden you put in basic thing like a compost heap okay now everybody has vegetable scraps in the kitchen Mm -hmm. if those are saved in a little bucket specially for that 
they can be taken down and it's amazing how much you'll accumulate. You've obviously got the, the weeds and things you're taking out of the actual garden, but it's the produce from your kitchen mixed in with produce, the lawn cuttings when we're able to cut the grass, um, all mixed together make the most marvellous compost which then be put back onto the soil, improve your soil, you'll get much better yield and any vegetables you're growing and it, it's a cheap way of producing your own compost and it doesn't take that long. Um, you do need to keep it moist, it's no good just piling it all up and putting a whole load of one particular part. Too much grass cutting for instance when they're moist we're just going to a soggy mass. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're cutting back corder lines and plants like that, which are quite um, brittle almost, you put those on in too much, you're going to have the obvious effect. So you've got to mix it, and there's a lot of work being done on producing really good compost, um, Quite a few, probably quite a few books written about it even, but um, it, it's a very easy, basic thing to have, but do get one and put it in the corner of the garden away from the main house, because um, you don't want to be looking at your compost really, heap. No. <laughs> no, not that. I mean, the, the slatted wooden ones actually are not that unattractive. No. But put some nice plants in front of it to screen it um, and make sure you can get to it without having to keep treading on the same sure. bit of soil or just have yeah. some paving slabs and, which can get you to your compost heap. Mm. And do save everything from the kitchen, mm. not... Um, meat or things of that type, no, no, no because no. you'll attract the rats it's all, then. It's all then the greens, you'll... isn't it? The greens and the browns. Which That's is, right, yeah, absolutely, yeah, but yeah. save every scrap. Yeah. And, and your contents of your vacuum cleaner, I was emptying mine out yesterday, and it's very satisfying. Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, my dog hair. Of course. Because we've got these two big medical detection dogs mm -hmm. who are both Labradors, and they're both golden, and they produced a vast quantity and yeah. that all goes on the compost heap no. and I expect the birds come down and pinch bits off the compost heap to line their nests. Yeah, so plenty of sustainability yes. for the birds then. Absolutely. And, uh, so Pauline, we were talking um, on, on the compost heap side of things and keeping it well watered. What are your thoughts about watering the garden in general? Well, it's far better to use rainwater mm -hmm. rather than tap water if you can, especially living in this area where you've got a very high lime content in the tap water. If you've got a really easy to get at um, downpipe from your roof, so it's the rainwater you're collecting, mm -hmm. connect onto that a water butt. Um, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes, but it's amazing how much you collect, especially if you've got a a biggish roof, you get masses of water and then you have a tap at the bottom so that can be tapped straight into your watering can and you've got rainwater which is really, really good. So yes, water butt is a definite. Yeah, and I say if you've got the space you can obviously add on other water butts, you can actually create a mm. series of them which can look... I have. Yeah, yeah indeed. <laughs> yes, so... at the side of my um, wood store... Mm. I've got the roof of the wood store connected mm -hmm. to three water butts standing yeah. in the corner. You yeah. don't actually see them. Most Perfect. of the time they're behind all the logs, yeah. but one connects into the other okay. and you, uh, it gives you a, a large quantity of water. Even now, I've still got some water in those ones. My word. All the That's... other ones, completely dry, <laughs> but I've still got a little bit in my triple Perfect, yes. And thinking about water sustainability at the garden centre and nursery here, obviously we've got a big site, we've got lots of plants, lots of containers to, to water. Um, are we, what are we doing here to, to, to manage well, that? Well, we have, uh, many years ago, Peter, one of my sons, organised and made an enormous reservoir for us. All the water from the roofs of this building and also from the selling area, because when we're watering, a lot of water is actually wasted, but that water is collected in um, the water, um, I don't know what you call them, grates, are they? Right, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and all that water goes down into the reservoir. That is then stored and then pumped up and used for watering the plants. Um, obviously some of that has come from tap water at certain times of the year, but um, I believe it's up to about four years ago, we didn't used to use hardly any tap water we could actually be self-sufficient on water. In the recent years, I'm afraid that has not been quite as sustainable, I suppose no. one to say, because we haven't had the amount of rain 
and therefore the reservoir has gone very much lower, which is a great shame. But we, we did our best, and hopefully yeah. if we get some more rain, it'll start to refill again. Um, it's all in place, that's the thing, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is, that's, absolutely. That's, that's good. And of course, like we always say at the Garden Centre, it's always the wrong type of rain, isn't it? I mean, when, when yes. the weather breaks in the, the, the current heat spell, I'm sure anecdotally mm. we'll look at that, you know, we have heavy downpours, but of course that's the worst type of rain on very dry parts. Yes, it just uh, bounces so. off and mm. doesn't yeah. fill the cracks up because Indeed. this is an area we've got a lot of clay in the soil and the cracks are getting mm. absolutely, well, they're... I feel slightly concerned sometimes when walking the dogs because they tend to rush around Indeed. that one of their paws might go down because yep. the cracks are that wide now. Indeed. So we have to be careful where we're walking now that um, we don't have that trouble. Sure. And obviously, you know, we've got that, that, that big yellow disc in the sky creating all the, the problems on, and all the pleasures of summer. Mm. But of course, um, it, has, it is a double-edged sword, really, oh, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, because on the, um, the roof of the, the large shop area... Um, we've got a lot of solar panels Mm -hmm. and these are producing at least enough power to keep all the refrigeration that we need to have for the restaurant and other units. Um, So we're producing our own electricity. In the same way as uh, in my own house, um, we've got a smallish panel, but we put one in when we first moved in and it didn't cost a lot of money and within um, two years, we were producing a, a lot of, um, of heat from that, mm. um, hot water and other things. And you've only just look around. And what I cannot understand is one of these new building sites, why don't they put solar panels on the roofs when they actually do the construction? Yeah. Because it makes it so much easier. We had quite a few plumbing problems to, when we did ours to make it mm. viable. Yeah. Whereas if the builders would only put solar panels on the roofs of the properties, probably water butts as well yes, around the property. Yeah. Water uh, storage. Resi- yes, water storage it's underground it's even yeah, would yeah. be possible. Yeah. All these things ought to be thought about yeah. um, mm. and done, but mm. it really annoys me watching new houses going up, yep. no solar panels. Yep. I've yet to see a building development with so I'd love to hear it'd be a very good selling point wouldn't it certainly. it would <laughs> yes absolutely yes. yes oh yes this is for, for gardeners as well and I suppose yeah the solar side of things certainly has impacted on the garden centre side as we're we're using lots of solar powered lights these days in yes. our gardens and that that sort has moved up you've got to watch that one because don't have solar power lights going all night because you're going to be disturbing nature Don't forget that moths are attracted to them and lots of other insects. So be careful using them. I think they look brilliant, gardens, but make sure they're ones you can turn off so that you're not going to be disturbing beautiful moths at night. Um, Obviously the the bats like it because they think, oh, yes, I go down to that solar light, I can get my supper very easily. But we do need to be very careful on our use of power in the gardens. Yeah. I think on the on the solar power, some of the a lot of the new lights have a, a timer, so they switch off after I think eight hours or six hours. Yes. So hopefully midnight they've uh, they've done their their, their yes. work and they can switch off. So that's yes. an important point when you when you're buying. Pauline, obviously we've, we've we're seeing major changes at the moment with the the use of, of peat or peat free composts, and I know anecdotally um, we've been chatting about the, the issues of, of peat-based compost that are going to have in, in the garden. Um, any thoughts on, on your experience using them so far? When I f- The first bag of peat-free compost I used was a disaster because I didn't know the trick to make it really, really sodden before you started to plant in it. Um, it, it does work well. I mean, I've used it since then and have made sure it's very, very wet, before planting into it, then don't let it dry out. If you do, it is very difficult. This is my experience. Mm -hmm. It's probably not universal. I expect there's a lot of people say, oh, no, it's absolutely fine, no problem at all. But I personally think that it is more difficult, but like anything in gardening, we've Mm -hmm. got to learn. Um, Learn what to use and how to use it. Um, I think the manufacturers need to be a bit more explicit on how to change most definitely yes um so the instructions on the bags actually really give this information 
um, and give the gardener advice as what to do and to keep the it is the moisture level feed level no problem it is moisture which, um, which is key we're... if you if you're propagating if you're using those composts for for seed sowing mm. or for, for for cuttings it's even more vital isn't it yes uh, on that absolutely. Side side. yes okay um one more sort of question as we sort of come to the end of the the, the chat pauline is uh, your favorite plant or plants or group of plants can i can i pin you down to a favorite very difficult i love plants <laughs> yeah. with a big s at the end i would say probably for containers and gravel gardens things like that structural plants mm-hmm. cordylines that type of thing which give you a lovely wow factor by just looking at them probably even some of the the palms and things that we can now grow outside now yeah but beyond that i'm afraid i would go for fruit trees as well i'm afraid because i just love growing my own fruit yeah so uh, structural plants i would say yes yeah definitely on that um in dig it we always ask our guests for their uh, their castaway garden castaway plant you know you're stranded on that virtual desert island right well if i'm stuck on a desert island all by myself yep. i'm going to have a lot of time to myself indeed um unlike the program on the radio i don't i'm not given a book as well okay. <laughs> so i'm going to be growing so am i allowed to take a big not a plant but a box of seeds of legumes yes i think we'll allow that yes definitely yes. and then i yep. can grow my peas and beans yes. and i'd have to find a shady spot to grow them <laughs> but uh, no I, th- I think i would go for something like that that's, that's a good choice yeah you'll have food pretty quickly yes absolutely that side yes. as well yeah and finally finally on um on the game, we like to find any any new amusing stories any anecdotes from uh, from from our guests and i'm sure Working at a garden centre and a nursery over the years, you've we've had, had some you. funny yeah. ones. Yeah, I've got a few written down, and yeah. I'll read out. And I mean, if I don't know whether you'll think them funny or not, it'd be interesting no, to see. Was... But these are ones which people, they're all genuine. Right. Absolutely, I have. You know, it's mm-hmm. not things I've made up. No, of course. Now this is all, as you know, we do a lot of hedging plants. Mm-hmm. Hedges get laid. Um, yes, I think we. Well, Laying I would know what it is. Yes, um, yes. anyway. A customer phoned to complain that his bare root hedging plants had died. We asked how he planted them and what he'd done. He replied that he'd laid them. And quite what he meant, he said he had laid them out, roots to top, in a long line where he wanted the hedge to grow. Oh, okay. That's not um, going to end well, is it? It definitely <laughs> didn't end well, apart from drying out. Of course. That was one. Mm-hmm. Um, a pot-grown primula. Customer bought a pot-grown primula in the winter, then complained it was dried up and looked completely dead. Inquired what they'd done with it. He said, well, I put it on the top of the arger to keep it nice and warm. Ouch. <laughs> That's what the plant said. <laughs> and then... Right, a customer came in one day down to speak to Chris, wanted some large bamboo plants, because he needed an instant screen. It was taken out and showed our plants, and he said, oh gosh, no, they're much too small. But on the way out, he spotted some eight-foot bamboo canes. So he returned to Chris and asked, how quickly would the eight-foot canes take to root and grow? Mm. Yes, I sort of remember that well. Yes. yes. So, yes. <laughs> I mean, we, we get, Yeah. I wouldn't say weekly, but we do get quite a few, which we have to keep a very straight face yes. Give the if the customers come in. Of course. And give a very straight answer. Yep. And then we wait till they're well out of the way, and then we have a good laugh. Indeed. It's, and, which it's is what gardening should be about, I think. Most definitely. Enjoying I mean, it, yeah. laughing, enjoying it with friends and yep. everything else. Yeah. And learning, which these three, three customers had to do. Certainly. Pauline, it's been a delight chatting, and we've learned so much about the history of, of Buckingham Garden Centre, but more importantly about the, the passion you have as a, as a gardener. Thank you very much for your time today. That's been a pleasure. It would be nicer if it had been a bit cooler, Indeed. even though we're in a lovely building provided by Melbourne. Indeed. <laughs> um, but it's a wee bit hot. Just a bit. Thank yes. you again. Thank That's you. a pleasure. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. 
The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.